this is Keith Lyons with the Anxious Mammal again. Um, this is, I believe, presentation number eight of our 13 part series on trauma. So we discussed um, exposure to the brain body. We discussed what clinical diagnosis of trauma is. We discussed um, what some of the symptoms are that we can expect and how childhood adversity impacts us throughout the life, where trauma comes from, the inception and the continuation of trauma. And now we are going to move into various trauma approaches. So we last, um, the last recording, last webinar that we just did was on the LEAP approach, which is an approach that I put together on how to work with uh, clients. Um, so that was a, mainly for the clinician, but it was also for you know people who may identify as clients because you need to know what you should expect when you go in to see a therapist and you should hold them to that standard. So today we're going to talk about exposure therapy. This is really one of the oldest and one of the first accepted and approved interventions for trauma therapy. This is still used in various settings. Um, it's very popular at the Veterans Affairs Association for PTSD management, um, as well as some newer versions of exposure therapy have been adopted, which we're going to go over as well, because there are many different types of exposure therapy interventions. It's not just the classic one that people know about, where you go in and tell the therapist you're afraid of clowns, and then he says one moment and comes back with a clown costume screaming at you. Um, that is scary, first off, and it is not how we do it all the time. That is a, a exaggerated version of a form of exposure therapy, which we're going to talk about, but there's a lot of different systematic ways to expose people to these fears to show them the rational challenges to uh, these emotional um, fears that they hold. So, exposure therapy. One general category is in vivo, and this just means basically in person. So this is exposure to situations that are typically avoided. Um, because the individual perceives them as dangerous. Um, so exposure to situations that are triggers or reminders of the trauma, but it's done in a controlled setting, a safe setting, with a therapist who's trained and able to assist the client in identifying that they are safe and bringing them back to the present and grounding them if they experience, um, you know, overstimulation and feel like they're getting pulled into a flashback or disassociating, things like that. This is kind of the old school classic version, and there's different categories within in vivo. Um, but this is still one of the most popular is doing this in person, systematically exposing an individual to basically doses of the thing that they are afraid of. Imaginal, the client can just bring up a picture or a movie. Um, they can, a memory in their head of a situation that normally causes them to feel anxious or panicked or fearful. And then this can be discussed and reviewed. This can be useful for people who have very, very intense phobias or fears of specific triggers that maybe in vivo would be possibly more damaging or at the very least make them say, screw this and not return. So imaginal is, um, this is actually kind of done in EMDR because the clinician asks the patient to bring up an image that best represents the worst moment of a memory that they've identified. So in a sense, imaginal exposure occurs in EMDR on a very short, limited basis. Next, we have introceptive. This is where the body sensations that the individual experiences are confronted. So they identify where they feel it. Do they feel a tightness in the chest? Do they feel a nausea in the stomach? Do they feel lightheaded? Do they feel like their legs become heavy? And more specifically, which of these symptoms are they? they? These symptoms, you know, in the body may be a response to trauma, but then they have a response to the symptoms in response to trauma, and now they have a fear of the symptom itself. So introceptive is good at working with these physical symptoms that the person has. Um, there may be ways to try and recreate a racing heart rate or recreate rapid breathing for the client in the moment, and then having the clinician assist them in moving through that and seeing that they can handle it, that they will be okay, that it will not kill them, etc., to try and challenge the thought that is attached to the emotional disturbance in response to the physical trigger sensation.
And lastly, we have uh, the newest one to enter the field, which is virtual reality. This is a newer type of exposure therapy, using these virtual realities to actually place people in environments and situations that are a repeat of the trauma situations they experience or a close approximation. This obviously has to be done with specific clients who are able to handle this. And the research is still emerging, so there's, there is research supporting its efficacy, its ability to help, but um, it's a little more mixed and less research is available than these other methods that we have mentioned. So why exposure therapy out of all the different approaches that we have? Why would a clinician choose to use this? So these next bullet points here are support for why you should use exposure therapy. It's not saying that this is the best, this is what should always be used. This is just saying, here is the reason that some of the research and other clinicians have identified as why they should use exposure therapy over other therapies in a given situation. Exposure therapy is based on a behavioral stimulus response and based on cognitive reprocessing. So you're going after the, be the behavior and the belief and certain exposure therapies also go after the body. So in, you know, technically you're going after the mind and the body and you're also targeting the behavior. So you're kind of doing the CBT approach, cognitive, behavioral, right? You're looking at emotion, thought, behavior, how they interact and targeting all of them. So it can be a comprehensive approach for the individual if appropriate. Um, exposure to um, triggers like this can have been shown to reduce PTSD symptoms um, through inhibitory learning or in, inhibitory learning, I guess tomatoes, tomatoes. But this is basically helping the client understand that they can inhibit their responses and that they can be safe and that these are not happening in the moment. So this helps build a challenge to the thoughts which help change and challenge the behaviors and the emotions. Reprocessing occurs um, as the client works through the exposure therapy and the trauma event is decreased in intensity through multiple exposures because if you are afraid to go outside and you walk outside over and over, it's gonna become less and less and less fearful over time eventually because you keep having evidence contrary to the belief. I go outside, I'm okay. I go outside, I'm okay. I go outside, I'm okay. So eventually that's gonna be enough to challenge the thought enough to where it's willing to change with a little bit of support. Um, clients can learn from the very initial session that they can handle exposure to these. If they have the right setting and the right support, they can bring up these triggers that normally throw them you know, off the rails out in their normal life and they can, they can face it, talk about it, experience it, manage it, and walk out of there safe. Side note, one of the noted possible downfalls of exposure therapy is the dropout rate because if I say I'm afraid of clowns and you put me in a room full of clowns, it's gonna be difficult for me to want to come back. So exposure therapy needs to be done systematically and in doses that the patient can clearly handle and it's not gonna deter them from seeking further uh, mental health support. One really good one, education level does not matter. Um, if they have a developmental dis disability, it can make a difference, especially depending on how severe, but socioeconomic status has no no influence in this treatment modality, which is really nice. The process for those PTSD, um, so it helps the individual learn that they can tolerate it. Usually they can learn this from the first session. They can be confronted by these triggers that they experience in the environment, and they do not have to respond with fear. They actually can experience these trauma triggers and still identify as safe. So before doing exposure therapy, these are the three things that need to be addressed. Is the client adequately resourced? Which means, can the client state shift? Can they go from anxious to calm relatively, not easy, but you know, well, especially with the support of the clinician? Do they have grounding techniques? Do they have positive imagery they can focus on? Do they have other mindfulness-based kind of interventions or somatic-based interventions they can use to get themselves to come back down to the present calm the response in the nervous system, get out of their head, and not feel like they're gonna to go to that tipping point where they lose it. Also identify, does the client show signs of a disassociation? 
do they completely remove themselves from the sensation, the thoughts, any of that? Because that's difficult, because if they're not attaching to the imagery or the sensory input in their body, it's going to be hard to process through that stuff, because that's what they need to feel so that they can lessen and lessen and lessen that. And finally, do they have adequate time to do a full processing session? Um, is there time at the end for you to regulate? You don't want to get a client activated and exposed and then be like, okay, time's up, sorry. You need to have time to help them calm and regulate. So when I do any kind of interventions that will activate the client, whether it be exposure, EMDR, or just psychotherapy, I always watch the clock to make sure I save at least five minutes to do a quick mindfulness-based kind of walkthrough. So I'll have them close their eyes and I'll have them do a little body scan, noticing their feet, noticing their feet on the floor, their right foot, their left foot, any differences, noticing any sensations between their neck and their waist. What does that feel like? Is it a shape, a color, sharp, fuzzy? Noticing the dominant sound in the room, what does it sound like? Noticing another sound below that, what does that sound like? Back to the feet, etc. You don't have to do that one, there's a million of them, but that is one that I use because it's simple and it seems to work well with my clients. And then I have them do that, and then I ask them, how do you feel after? We check in, and sometimes I'll even ask them from zero to 10, 10 is the worst you could feel. Where do you think you feel walking out of this room? That way, if they say like a six, I'm gonna be like, oh, okay, we're gonna have to find a couple more minutes and let's do another technique. You cannot let the person leave the room activated because it's just, number one, it's just cruel. Um, and number two, it's not safe for them, and it's going to be detrimental to the healing process that you're working on. So here's some different techniques for exposure therapy. Prolonged exposure therapy. So this does incorporate psychoeducation, so teaching the person about trauma, anxiety, and helping them to challenge some of the beliefs that they have and do some restructuring in their cognition, in their brain. You can actually change the structural makeup of the brain. The physical brain can change when you learn new thoughts and new behaviors. You start to build new pathways. And if you start doing something different than you did before over and over and over, eventually this new connection that you made will get stronger, stronger, thicker, bigger, bigger. And then the other one will become um, less likely to occur because you've created this new one that, has be, that is now bigger. It is um, going to be the one that your brain wants to go to because it has become the new habit. Flooding is kind of the old school one that people see in some of the old movies and things. Um, and this is where you will, you will, I guess technically you could say, I don't like clowns and then the clowns you could dress like a clown and come in. I don't know any of them that are gonna do that because it's a little bit ridiculous and crazy, but in the sense it's like, I'm afraid of snakes. Okay, here's a, watch this video that's just snakes and watch it for a little while. And so you just flood the individual with images or exposure in some way to the um, fearful object, situation, person, place, thing until the response begins to lessen. And you just keep doing this and doing this and doing this until they become less and less and less reactive. Systematic desensitization. So this is gradual exposure, not flooding. So you gradually expose them to approximation. So they're afraid of snakes, maybe show them a little toy snake that's tiny, unrealistic, maybe it's colors that wouldn't exist. Then maybe show them a bigger snake that is a toy. It's the size of a real snake and it's very realistic. Then maybe have them hold that. Then maybe have them watch a video of uh, pictures of snakes. Then maybe a video of movies of snakes. Then if you happen to have snakes for some reason, have them actually be in the room with a snake in the tank away from them and then move the tank closer to them. So this is systematic, gradual exposure. You make the threat get more and more and more threatening, but as you do this, you help them develop relaxation techniques. So you don't just have the snake in the tank sitting next to them. It's across the room. You ask them how they're feeling with that. You have them do some relaxation techniques to the session with the snake in the tank. And then maybe next session, they sit on the couch next to the tank. And you do relaxation techniques and they're gonna be able to feel less and less stress because they've been systematically exposed. Implosive therapy, this is usually imaginal. So the um, therapist might have the client think of situations that would exaggerate their fear. So like afraid of clowns, 
it might be. Imagine a situation where you're at a circus and all of a sudden you turn around and you see 10 clowns running at you with, with spiky teeth. Um, I have not personally done implosive therapy, so I don't know if that makes any sense. Maybe that sounds crazy, but um, it's essentially having them experience something that they are afraid of in an exaggerated way. Again, typically imaginal because how do you expose them to there's many fears that it would be hard to exaggerate. Like if they're afraid of snakes, I mean, I guess you could do, you can't do something extreme like put them in a pit full of snakes. That's not going to be ethical or allowed, and they're not going to do it. So imaginal is usually the route with implosive therapy. Written exposure therapy is a newer one as far as being used and approved. <clears throat> exposure is through writing. So the individual um, will write about the event in sections, and there's a systematic process to this. We're actually going to go over this one a little bit in detail um, towards the end of this, so just hold on to that one. Exposure and response prevention. So this is for like work with obsession, compulsion, and so OCD kind of things. You expose them to a situation, like if they need to wash their hands four times, they try not to allow their hand wash their hands four times. So you try and expose them to situations where they need to, where maybe their hands are dirty, but you pre they prevent themselves from washing their hands, and they try and see if they can handle the discomfort. This is sometimes useful, but when you're talking about obsession compulsion, there's other ways that are going to be more appropriate, and this way may not be appropriate for some OCD clients. So just want to do more research about that one if you're a clinician and you want to incorporate that. Graded exposure just means gradual increase of the stimulus. So it's similar to um, systematic desensitization. I can't say it. Desensitization. There we go. Um, there's a little bit of differences in there. I'm going to let you look at those um, because, again, uh, exposure therapy is not something I use a lot, so I am not as versed in these um, nuances between the graded exposure and the uh, systematic this, um, exposure. So written exposure therapy, um, this is one that I do use. It has been shown to have very low dropout rates, 10%, which is really, really pretty impressive compared to other trauma interventions, especially exposure therapies, because ex exposure therapies have been shown to have high dropout rates. I mean, the individual is having to be, you know, confronted with these triggers, and there's many people who just don't understand it or can't agree to it. So written exposure therapy, five sessions total, which is nice, it's brief. First session is 60 minutes, and then the rest of the sessions are only 40 minutes. The instructions are read verbatim. It's a very structured approach, similar to EMDR. The client needs to write the entire 30 minutes that they're given. If they finish, they start over and they write again and identify if there's any more details that they didn't notice from the first time, and they re-expose through the writing. Therapists can be in the room. They just work. The therapist actually is just hanging out there. They don't have to do anything during the writing piece. The sessions are weekly, so the entire thing should take five weeks. The clients might have trauma that is cumulative, right, built up. So clients should identify an event that's most upsetting and do that, and then um, they can move on to other ones. The written exposure therapy can be used for different um, targets. Here's some references for you. So the first one is on how to maximize the benefits of exposure therapy. The next one is um, Something that discusses this journal article that discusses exposure therapy and CBT and how they interact with each other, especially in PTSD. And then here's the reference to the written exposure therapy book, which is a really good book and you should get. I think it's a useful one. You can actually get the book as a clinician and use it with your clients, or you can get it as um, just a, any everyday person or a client and use it for yourself. It outlines things very clearly. I'd recommend you use the therapist because there are some pieces that you really need that guidance and support, but if you can't afford that, then you shouldn't be blocked from mental health. So if you have any questions about it, you can reach out to me too. I'll, I'll do anything I can to support you with that. Um, so again, any questions, comments, concerns, you notice any discrepancies, or you think something I shared is not true or BS, go ahead and send me a message at theanxiousmammal.com. You can just contact me on the contact page under the About Me tab, and I would be glad to answer any questions or respond to any comments or concerns. So we will continue our exploration of well-researched and well-proven um, trauma interventions 
in the next session. I don't remember which exactly we'll be focusing on, so it'll be a surprise. Hope to see you guys there.